Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Good okay. uh, Welcome. Good to see you guys. We are excited to be here. We thank you for coming in today. Uh, this is something that we're, this is literally a life, once in a lifetime opportunity. We felt privileged to be here at this event. Uh, our, our presentation that we're going to talk about today are uh, if students with learning differences can succeed first. And uh, just kind of give you some background. We're from Chicago. Uh, our team is from Walcott High School. We are Chicago's uh, exclusive school, specifically for students with learning differences, um, that is college prep. And, and to give you some context, um, we were recently founded two years ago, 2013. Uh, we're a nonprofit. We're a private school, independent school uh, in Chicago. And, uh, we, and, and actually, based on our school, we um, uh, started uh, FTC two years ago, uh, and we have a wonderful uh, just kind of testimony and to celebrate the successes of our students and to, to really just share you know, their personal experiences and uh, talk about and address this is an issue that uh, we feel is not being addressed enough uh, in FIRST competition. As you know, FIRST is a very successful national uh, competition uh, pushing STEM uh, for uh, high school students and uh, elementary students. So uh, we have, we're really privileged to talk about this. Uh, we're going to do some quick introductions. My name is Mr. Bay. I'm actually the coach of Team FTC uh, 8728 at Wilcott School. Uh, we'll just go ahead and do some quick introductions. I'm Victor. I'm Kylie. I'm Ben. I'm Dan. I am. <laughs> I'm Tyler. I'm Ella. And I'm Diego. All right. Uh, to actually start us off, we're going to do a fun, interactive uh, activity where we're going to pull you guys and talk about some learning differences. So I don't know, has anyone used Polev everywhere? Is this, uh, okay, some of you guys. So we'll have some of our students come around. You're going to need your phone out. So if you have your phone, uh, we're going to start with this question. And oh, that got cut off, so let me go ahead and fix that. The first question I want us to um, look at is thinking about what is actually uh, dyslexia. So what is, what is dyslexia? We're going to talk about learning differences. Uh, when people hear the word learning difference, it, can, it means a lot of different things. And you know, things like um, you know, dyslexia, ADHD. So we're going to address one specific learning difference, and that's dyslexia. Uh, so if you guys have your phone out, maybe some of our team members can come out and help you guys out. Uh, but go ahead and text. Kenny Bay, that's me, 176. Uh, you're going to actually text the number 37607, uh, and you're going to text Kenny Bay 176 in there. And then type in A if you guys think dyslexia is a contagious disease like chickenpox. Okay? Select A if you think that's the case. Select B if, it's, if you think it's considered a mental health problem. Uh, select C if you think it's a specific kind of reading difficulty that do not affect the general intelligence. And then select D if you think it's a disorder that affects your diet. So go ahead and try this. Uh, we're going to have you guys, so far C looks like it's a popular answer at the moment. Go ahead, we'll give you a few minutes to...
This is fun, right? Y'all on uh, hold here. Okay. Did everyone get a chance? Okay. So we, uh, and, and, and the prize, um, if you guess, raise your hand if you guess um, le uh, letter C. Raise your hand if you guess letter C. Okay, congratulations. Yes, it is letter C. Um, dyslexia is defined as a specific kind of reading difficulty do not affect the general intelligence. If you guess letter C, we actually have a prize for you. So if you could raise your hand, we have uh, letter C. Uh, Ella, can we have a couple team members <laughs> pass out our prize? Yeah, so we'll go ahead and pass those out. You guys, uh, yeah. Uh, congratulations, letter C is correct. Good. Now, now that we define what dyslexia is, I want to um, take a look at the next question here, and we're going to do another pull out, uh, another pull out question. Let's take a look at this next question. Now that we define what dyslexia is, or what is dyslexia? How many people in the U.S., according to PBS.org, is dyslexia? How many? How many people in the U.S. are dyslexic? Go ahead and text in letter A. If you think one to five percent of the U.S. is is left. Go ahead and text in B, 5 to 10 percent. C is 10 to 20 percent. D is 25 to 35 percent. And then if you think it's more than half of the population that you think it is like sick, go ahead and type in D. Okay? So it looks like most of us are guessing D. About 58 percent of us <coughs> is thinking that 25 to 35% of the U.S. is okay. Did everyone get a chance to guess? Okay, great. All right, so we'll, re we'll reveal the answer. Uh, raise your hand if you guessed letter C. Letter C. Congratulations, it is letter C. So if you guess letter C, you get another prize. So we can hand out, thank you very much, Ella. Hey, can we help, can we come help her out? Yeah, so if you guess letter C, 10 to 20%, according to PBS, of the U.S. population is dyslexic. Right? Surprising. Right? Maybe some of you guys, oh my goodness, that's, maybe you think it's a large number, maybe you think it's a small number. One, one more question, last question. We're going to do one more poll question. And this, this last poll question, let's go ahead and take a look at this. And this last question is, what well-known person below have been identified with dyslexia. Okay. What well-known person below have been identified with dyslexia? Leonardo da Vinci has been A. You think it's Leonardo da Vinci? And as you all know, Dean Kamen, the guy who founded First Competition. Text B if you think it's him. Albert Einstein, type in letter C if you think it's Albert Einstein and D for all the above. Okay. Go ahead and make your guess. What well-known person had been identified as a sex Okay. Let's get a chance to think about it. Okay. Okay, hold on. All right, so let's just do a simple hand raise. Okay, yeah. So raise your hand if you think it's A. Raise your hand if you think Leonardo da Vinci has been identified with a sex Raise your hand if you think it's B, Dean King. Okay, a couple of you guys. Raise your hand if you think it's C, Albert Einstein. Okay. And what about D, all of the above? Yeah. Yeah, D is, D is the correct answer. So, do we have enough markers? <laughs> you all get markers. Everyone gets uh, the markers. Yeah, so. All right, yes, D, all of the above. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, Dean Kamen, Albert Einstein, uh, especially. And, and we read an article, and I, I kind of want to go 
talk about, uh, just kind of outline of what we're going to share uh, this morning. Uh, we have the privilege of sharing. And the outline that we're going to The outline in which we're going to discuss, uh, we're actually going to start with the success story. That's where our inspiration came from. And as you know, he, he helped found first the competition. Uh, there's a bunch of articles out there uh, in the University of Michigan and, and various uh, news reports of Dean Keenan publicly acknowledging his um, you know, dyslexic background. Okay? We're going to talk about our Walcott approach, and, and we'll end with the student panel kind of format discussing um, and highlighting our students with their learning differences and their experiences in first and how that helped really uh, boost their confidence in, in STEM uh, education. So, so the article, and, and I'm not going to read this, you can, you can find this on Google, but we were really inspired by the success story in the region. That's how it started. Uh, as you know, Wolcott School um, is, is, is a nonprofit school based in Chicago that was recently founded where we support students with learning differences uh, that include dyslexia, ADHD, uh, people with dyscalculia, uh, also even word processing issues. And the story of Dean came in, and if you can look this up you know, on your own, uh, he actually identified his struggle with dyslexia. And he shared basically how uh, in school he had a, you know, just a hard time um, with uh, his, his, as you call it, his learning disability. And we don't like to use the word disability. Okay? We like to say learning difference because that, that is, it, it is true. I mean, it's really, we, our brains are wired differently in which we learn. But despite his difficulties in school, Kamen really excelled in his creativity. And we like to think of these learning differences as not a challenge, as not a, uh, you know, a thing that hinders us, but it's actually like a superpower. It helps us think in such unique ways. And that's what helps us be so innovative in different things. And we're going to talk about those experiences uh, you know, with, with our students and also the experience we had uh, meeting, meeting people from Google and Microsoft. We're going to talk about that too. So give us a little background more about our school. Here's a little uh, two minute video clip to kind of share where we're coming from. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. We come together to create something that really has never existed before. Walcott School for teenagers who are bright, talented kids seeking more than. It's okay. We have a video outside of the back of the studio, actually. Sometimes the Wi Fi is on. We come together to create something that really has never existed before. Walcott School for We look at what our kids can do. It's a strength-based program, strength-based education. And so by using learning differences, we're describing the fact that, yeah, people learn differently and our students learn differently. When you have the, the benefit of a great education here and you come out, and you go out in the world, you'll find the ways that your mind, that its differences, are actually a benefit. There's a lot of different ways to access your learning. For instance, we're reading this one book in English. And there's three different ways to access it. You could do it online, you could do the actual book, or you could do the graphic novel. And that's really cool because everyone accesses the same information, but just differently. Here, the leap from completely not knowing if you're going to be able to do well in high school, and then coming here and being like, wow, I really can do well, and I know I'm learning, and I know what I'm learning, and I'm able to articulate it to other people is an amazing feeling. Walcott will be an extraordinary tool to the kind of successful path that I'm talking about. But you go get them and don't give up and 
don't ever doubt your ability to succeed. All right. So I have to that. Uh, so that, that gives you a little background about our school, and, and then I want to go more specifically talk about our actual competition. Um, just again for the people that walked in. Uh, we're a nonprofit independent college prep high school with students with learning differences. Uh, we just opened in 2013 our inaugural class of 33 freshmen and sophomores. Uh, we've obtained over 13.3 million funding uh, and campaign funding, um, you know, recently. And uh, uh, over currently, um, we ha actually have 300 original donors that supported us um, in, in the Chicagoland area. So. Again, we're super, super thankful to be here, uh, and we're going to kind of address and talk about our wonderful, outstanding experiences with FIRST competition, and even talk about maybe some of the challenges um, among our students with uh, learning differences at FIRST. Now, that's, this, just this last year alone, we had the privilege and opportunity to partner and work with uh, Google, Microsoft, and uh, we want to talk a little bit about this uh, national NSF grant that we uh, got with the University of Chicago. Uh, one amazing thing, like I've been teaching for a number of years, but um, we had fortunately um, developed some partnerships with uh, Google where, um, you know, uh, we actually spoke with employees at Google with learning differences. And we had a, a wonderful privilege and opportunity to interview these employees that have learning differences like dyslexia or ADHD. And they actually highlighted and, and was sharing with our students that really inspired us. Hey, look, like dyslexia is not, it's, it's not a thing where you're like, oh, I have dyslexia, you know, or I'm dyslexic, and you know, it's, it's going to be the end of the world. It, it's, it's not a condition in which um, it doesn't mean that you can't succeed. And, 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 and the, the employees at Google that we interviewed um, that have dyslexia uh, shared um, their personal st story of how they originally struggled in school and found just you know a hard time with word, word processing issues and felt feeling like a failure. But um, they come to realize that dyslexia is 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 not a challenge, but it's 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 a way to really think differently about um, you know how you're taught certain things. And some of the employees uh, we've talked to actually shared that their dyslexia is considered a superpower, and they're they have this uh, ability to really just uh, do their profession, either whether it's marketing or programming, at a very high level. As you know, like you look at those famous scientists that have been identified with dyslexia, Albert Einstein, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. You know, uh, we can go on and on. There's like uh, Sir Isaac Newton, uh, Thomas Edison, right? Uh, all been identified with dyslexia. Um, we've also had another. Uh, Really, and again, this past year, the National Hour, uh, National Hour of Code. Are you guys familiar with the National Hour of Code? Raise your hand if you're. Okay, so National Hour of Code is a big national movement pushing uh, for computer science uh, in schools across the country. And we we partnered with Microsoft for the National Hour of Code. We actually found out the CTO of Microsoft struggled with his ADHD, and it was an interesting story. We did a field trip out there, and honestly, I didn't know what to expect. Uh, it was literally three of the robotics teams. We were there. Um, we thought we were going to get like a kind of, you know, just basically an overview of the office. We weren't sure what we were going to be expecting, and um, and we were fortunate. I didn't even know at the time he was a CTO of Microsoft. He was just a very passionate guy, and uh, and he shared about his background with ADHD, and then that was a point to really connect. And, and we and as as our school is, you know, specifically this week for our students with learning differences, uh, we got to connect with the CTO and and, uh, and and through that he learned about our robotics program at TC first and he's very supportive at first and uh, ever since then we've been developing a stronger relationship with him. It's, it's, it was a bond that was created um, with the shared experience of our learning differences and uh, through robotics. Um, this next opportunity that we had, again, this past year, uh, we're super thankful, is um, we actually got this National uh, Science Foundation grant um, in collaboration with the University of Chicago. Uh, we're hoping to bring AP computer science principles to students with learning differences. And this is, again, an issue that hasn't been addressed across the country, and not enough of it. Um, uh, as we all know, computer science is being pushed in our curriculum. Uh, uh, recently, and we're from Chicago, CPS has made it mandatory for all, all public schools to teach computer science. But um, one hidden underrepresented group are the students with learning differences. 
And we have three, three goals uh, in the research program. We want to expand uh, participation in APCS principles course. We want to generate the knowledge in CS education, computer science education community, and develop specific guidance uh, in our curriculum and developers for teachers. We have a student that is um, part of our research um, here with the University of Chicago. And Kylie, if you can just share uh, just a little bit about your experience with the computer science um, grants. Okay, so I am part of this grant that um, switches our curriculum to a special type where it's an ex it's, it's like a big experiment that is this curriculum called SNAP from Berkeley College. And it's this program that is kind of like Scratch, but they can modify it whenever they want to update, like if we have a request for a different type of um, piece of code if we want. And it's just this, this website that you can snap together blocks of code, like SNAP. And I think it um, helps people who, who can't, who have maybe dyslexia, who can't read as well, and they're actually like color coded to be different types of um, code. Um, yeah, that's yeah. good. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start with our student um, this kind of testimony and discussion. Uh, and we're going to cover, each student is going to cover three points. So we'll have, uh, this is the order of our panel, Victor, Kylie, Ben, and Tyler, and i Diego. Uh, so each student, they're going to um, just kind of share um, their learning challenges. What, what learning challenges did you struggle growing up? And how did participating in this wonderful first competition that we're all involved in, how did it help you uh, really succeed? And you know, build your confidence, and, and then talk about what are your future goals and plans. So uh, if, if we can start with Victor, we'll go around and share uh, those three points. Hi, I'm Victor, and throughout my childhood, I was diagnosed with ADD, and I really struggled. I didn't understand what I was learning at all, and because of this, I genuinely thought that I was dumb, but that wasn't true at all. I just perceived things differently than other kids, and and because of this, I was completely unmotivated back then. I had no aspirations. But a couple of years ago, I kind of began to realize, you know, I was going to go nowhere if I didn't shape up. So uh, I feel like I've gotten a lot better. And, and um, robotics has helped me a lot because it's helped me realize my current self and my future self. Because my current self, um, I want to be successful with school robotics, but in the future I want to be a successful engineer and I have no intention of letting my learning difference get in my way. Um, so I'm Kylie and uh, I have Dyscalcula, which is um, the, it's basically math, but not where it's like dyslexia with math and I knew that I was different growing up and I didn't really know why until I, I was diagnosed by a neuropsychologist that I had dyscalculia and growing up I couldn't enjoy the, the wonderful math people did like in class and I had to be pulled out of class and I did third grade math in sixth grade and I was behind but when I found about first in high school I was like oh robots Ooh. and um, I love robots. Um, so the first has helped me open up a new world of computer science, which is math-based. Didn't guess it's math-based. And so um, I really like computer science. And yes, it's math, but I think that's really great. And first does wonderful things with that. And my future goals is to be in the computer science field because I love it. And I don't think that you know being not great in math should like hold you back from it because it's a wonderful field. Alright. So I'm a little like, so I don't have dyslexia, but I am a little imbalanced in my learning, so that's why I go to Wolcott. So I, I can get concepts, but the, like, the steps I go through it don't always end well. So for example, there will be homework assignment, and I'll do it, but I'll make the small little mistake of losing it. Teachers don't really like that. So, and um, you know, Wolcott, I go to Wolcott because there's actually a class for learning strategies. And what we do is we try to, they try to help me get organized so I don't do that as much. And in robotics, um, 
I like it because it helps it gets a good reminder that like little details matter. Like um, last year, because we're an all freshman team, um, it, we made the mistake of not bringing a, a backup battery. And you know we didn't think that through, and it turned out the battery started getting faulty. And you know it was a small detail, but we missed it, and it really was a big problem. For the future, um, I like you know books, I like cookies, I like robots. Not really sure what to do with all of those, but <laughs> trying to figure it out. Uh, hi, I'm Tyler. Um, as Ben said, we're all freshmen here. Um, I was you know, diagnosed with dyslexia when I was in first grade, you know, when I first found out what it was and what it meant to me, I was kind of crushed by it, you know, always having difficulty reading and doing math and things, you know, um, I always had a difficult time, kind of was separated from like the other students, put in like special classes, you know, kind of felt left out, felt less qualified to do work, you know. Um, I found out by, about Wolcott, you know, and I heard about it, I wasn't so sure about it immediately leaving my friends at my old school and coming here, but I'm so glad I did though because the experience has been like so amazing. I've had great opportunities to meet companies like Google and Microsoft and so many more and the opportunities just keep coming and it's so amazing. Um, you know, FIRST Robotics, it's a great program. I really enjoy working with robots. I love building the robots. Hands-on is like so fun to me. I love doing hands-on work. It's great. It's how I learn, so this was such a perfect like idea and setup for me to go through. Plans for the future, not super sure. Want to go into some engineering field, probably chemical engineering, maybe just an engineer, but I don't know. Future has a lot to hold. Hi, I'm Ella. Um, so I've always known I was different ever since like preschool. Um, I wasn't actually diagnosed that, that I had dyslexia and ADHD until I think it was third grade, it might have been fifth grade, um, but I always kind of knew that I was slower than the rest of the kids at reading and focusing in class. It's really hard. Um, it still is hard, but um, now that I know what I have and now that I'm going to Walcott, it's kind of been helping me to stay on task to focus on reading and trying to be better in school. Um, first, it's helped me because having dyslexia, it's where mostly um, your brain focuses on the creative side. So when you're reading things, your brain is like still on the creative side, so it jumbles up all the words and stuff. Um, so being in like a creative environment of a bunch of really awesome people is, um, it, it's really cool and it, it's good for me. I mostly focus on 3D printing and design and stuff. So it's really fun for me. Um, my plans for the future, I really like acting and singing. So I wanna keep on going with that and I also want to keep on going with robotics, at least until high school ends, maybe into college. Um, hello, I'm Diego. Um, I attended a Montessori school, which is a very small school, very um, hands-on. Um, because of that, I, they were able to catch my dyslexia early in my childhood. Um, and through the help of the Wilson program and many um, long nights of uh, reading, um, I was able to cope with my dyslexia. Um, first, this helped me in terms of, um, since I grew up in a very hands-on environment, I naturally wanted to gravitate towards a robotics and um, a building of a, of a robot. Um, and 
it really helped boost my confidence in the in the way of um, it wasn't so much reading and I almost could get away from it even though I have been able to cope with my dyslexia. Um, my future plans are to uh, head into the medical field. Um, I, there's another story behind that, but um, <laughs> but yeah, I have been able to cope with my dyslexia, so I'm proof that you know the system can work in the Wilson, and that's what I've grown up with, and I still use it to this very day. I want to say, like, I am super proud of these students to be vulnerable, to share their testimony. This is not an easy thing to do. Uh, and so we can, and, uh, I told my students I wouldn't cry, but uh, so, um, and we have to finish as a team. So I need to, I'd like to share my testimony as well. Um, and there aren't enough minorities sharing their vulnerability, vulnerabilities regarding learning differences. And I do want to share, I also struggled with um, ADHD and word processing growing up. And just reflecting on the past years through high school and even through elementary school, feeling like a failure, feeling like I'm not good enough, I'm not, I can't do this, or being pulled out in another class because I'm too slow in this, or uh, even, in, in, and I can share a little bit. Um, I actually started out as an engineer. And when I started out as an engineer, um, and I started to start different companies and working at different, um, I was released at a number of positions because I didn't have, have enough brain power. Uh, and just losing my job because I wasn't smart enough or not good enough. Uh, very disheartening. And feeling like, is there hope? Is there, am I just a complete failure? Um, uh, in high school, my freshman year, and I'm looking at our freshman class, I was in the lowest level math class. They put me in the L1, which is like the really like remedial, you know. And the turning point for me was freshman year in high school, we had locker partners. My locker partner, he was like the opposite set, uh, opposite uh, in terms of <coughs> position I was in high school. He was, my locker partner, his name was Jake, Jake Braz, I still remember. Super popular guy, double advanced math. He, he was very successful, all the kids loved him. And I was like this outsider that was, didn't have a lot of confidence in myself and I didn't feel like I was getting anywhere. And, um, and I still remember this today. Um, he was like the first real friend I had. He, uh, uh, you know, he said like, you know, um, uh, you, just, you, just, you, just don't, you just don't give up, you don't quit. And uh, I still remember winter, that winter uh, break, uh, he passed away from an accident. And, and I still remember to this day, his sister coming in and cleaning out his locker, and I was the only person with that locker in the hallway. And the last time we hung out was at my house, you know, we had a good time. And I realized life is short. Life is really short. And you want to take any opportunity, thing that presents itself, take advantage of the opportunity. And ever since then, like, um, I decided, like, you know, don't give up. Like, there's hope. You know, uh, your weakness is your strength. And, and, and I realized that um, from that moment, um, I really pushed myself to really take that extra step, to really take a risk, really, take a risk. Because uh, again, life is short. Um, I ended up graduating senior year high school, honors. I became, you know, excelled throughout high school. I wanted to pursue engineering, but that didn't work out. And that's okay. You make mistakes along the way, that's okay. You learn from your mistakes. Uh, and, and when I went to college, I actually went to U of I, Urbana-Champaign, uh, if you guys know. Um, and I was a uh, graduate res research assistant, and I'm like, wait a minute, what am I doing here? Why am I, um, and, and my background is actually in uh, Arctic clouds. I actually spent three years studying Arctic clouds in Alaska. And I'm like, this is not what I'm doing. Uh, this is not what I want to do. I want to teach. And that was, I met this teaching uh, assistant there that really kind of motivated to teach and to inspire. Did some volunteer work in uh, Kenya for 40 days. We visited hundreds of schools, and I realized there's a need for science, technology, engineering, math instructors, like quality teachers. Uh, that's where I got my calling out there. And this is the path I wanted to pursue, and I love doing this. Uh, even hearing our success stories, 
it, this is truly like I, I was last night. We were so excited we couldn't sleep last night. At least I couldn't sleep last night. Look at where we are. Look at this. Like this is literally a dream. Like I, I'm looking at this, and, and I woke up. Like I woke up. Like is this really happening? Is this really happening? And coming from where our background was, I am truly inspired. I'm truly thankful for first. I'm truly thankful for what this competition uh, does for our students. And we are super excited for what's to come. Uh, honestly, I told you know my students uh, next year, like we're going to do amazing things. You guys, you know, I hope I hope you guys can see like we'll do amazing things next year and the, the following years, and and I see a really bright future for all of us. Uh, so um, I actually want to um, end. I know we have about 10 minutes to Q and A. If there are any questions or answer, uh, questions that people want to ask regarding students with learning differences or resources that we can go around just, um, yeah, pass the microphone around. Yeah, no problem. Um, I was just wondering, uh, although I'm sure there are as many strategies as there are learning differences, I was just wondering if either you, either the panel, or you could share some of the strategies that your teachers have used that have helped you learn better. I'm a teacher, and we have students with learning differences all throughout our classes, and uh, we all know the benefits of FIRST, and I'm also wondering how I can serve some of the students that maybe aren't participating in FIRST in some of the ways that you've had a chance to benefit from in your school at Wilcox. Yeah, Wilcox. All right, great question. I know um, in my math class, every time that we have a test, we like to use our review sheets to help us because sometimes uh, for kids who have learning differences, they completely forget the information when they see a test. I know that happens to me. I don't know if it happens to you guys. But, um, <laughs> and in learning strategies, they like make sure that they check our planners, that we all know what our homework is, when tests are coming. Um, usually in classes, they have like schedules so that you know when there's going to be a test when there's going to be a homework assignment. Um, so I find that really helpful. Um, another really good way that I found is that um, they give you a lot of different opportunities to use a bunch of different tools and a bunch of different ways to do whatever you need to do. Homework, there's always online, there's actual paper. You know, There's always a ton of different ways. Making it compatible for the kid to actually be able to learn is one of the very important ways. So, you know, as I said before, I have a tendency of mi like misplacing or forgetting things. So what I do is we have this assignment planner and it's, you know, every day I check, like I write in what assignments I have. So I can look at it and see what assignments I have and when they're due. So I, I know like what I need to do for that day and I don't keep it all in my head. Because like sixth grade, you know, I went out of grade school, I was not ready, I didn't really have those skills, so. Um, at our school, we have something called um, academic coaching, which is a magical period of time after school. It's about an hour and 30 minutes. Um, and teachers come down and they can help you with, with your homework. And it's every day except Friday because we, there's no school till 5.30 on Friday, it's only 335. Um, and it's a wonderful way where you can plan your work, you can do your homework, you can study, it's just a great place to be at after school. Personally for me, I think that the best strategy that helped me was usually like the day before we take a test or even the day we're gonna take a quiz, uh, we actually play review games on like websites like Quizlet and Kahoot, and it's actually very helpful. Um, for me, um, during <laughs> tests and quizzes, um, having someone read the quiz or test to you helps uh, massively the difference between, you know, what happens if I just read it on my own and if someone else reads it is, for me, it was a big change. Um, so that is one way you can help them. Um, also, um, writing for them, since a lot of dyslexics seem to be uh, very good at dictating, but not as writers. Um, I mean, unless it's like writing, test, or reading, like that should be implied. Huh? Okay. 
And I'll, and I'll share from a teacher, teacher's perspective too. Uh, it's a great question. And this is an ongoing thing that we are, we're always evolving and learning our craft. Honestly, we'll be doing this for 20, 30 years. I could be doing it for a lifetime. I'm still learning the craft. And uh, we always look at it from the perspective of how do we look at it from a visual learner, an auditory learner, or a kinesthetic learner. Uh, I teach physics and math, and so we try to address all three of those. And so, how do I teach it from a kinesthetic uh, movement piece? Like, how, how can I teach laws of motion? Maybe we have to go out to the gym, we have to go outside of the park, uh, maybe we have to walk around the school um, and, and, and take a look at a lesson that way. Uh, visual learner, how do I, uh, what I do is that all the documents that I print out, hand out, they're all color coded. So homework is blue, notes are in white, quizzes are in yellow. So when you open their binder, it's a color coded binder. I've done some work with other schools and you open binders and sometimes, you know, I've seen students where like, it's literally a vomit of just papers like, scattered all over. And you know, and we've seen this a lot where students just kind of cram their stuff in their backpack and who knows, they may find it if they're lucky, right? Um, but I make it um, intentional in our, in our course to really have students open their binder watching them open it, put their color-coded notes into each tab appropriately. So, uh, and we do a lot of games, a lot of hands-on physical, we do tons of hands-on, like two, three laps, probably a week. A lot of hands, maybe some of the students, I think they would share, it's too much hands-on, because it's, you know, it's a lot, so. Uh, but we make it fun, exciting, and I love it, honestly, I enjoy it. This is like a passion of mine. Like, I think about, I eat breeds like teaching, like I think, we're, we have so many ideas, like, you know, in terms of uh, where we're gonna go in the future, and, I'm so, so, so excited. So, good. Uh, any other questions? Can we come? Yeah. First of all, I just want to say thank you to the panelists and to yeah. Kenny as well um, for being here. Your stories are really inspiring. I'm a parent, so I was getting a little emotional down front here, so yeah. sorry about that. Yeah. But, um, but again, that's how deeply you touched me personally. Um, but also I had a question for you, back to the team and your FTC yeah. team. I'm just curious about the structure. Yeah. Is this the entire team, first of all, and then also, do you have any special supports in place? I know you're specialized right. in your teaching and instruction, right. but is there anything else that you could share with maybe a district where they wouldn't have necessarily a team of just students with learning differences, yeah. but have individuals in there and how you might support them in that type of an environment? Yeah. environment? We are, like this is our whole time, our whole team. We do have a computer science part that is not here. Um, but we're like the main part of the team. Anybody else want to answer the other part? So, uh, like Ella said, we're the main part. We build the robot, you know, we do some of the coding. And the guy does the coding, which is why I said so much. Mm -hmm. um, but we do, uh, we do do a lot of hands-on stuff. I would try to figure out what the, uh, those individual strengths are and what they prefer to do and what they're good at doing and play off of those because being dyslexic gives you such a creative mind and helps you like navigate the way to success in many different easier ways or harder ways, you know? So just play to their strengths and use those as a power. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> to add on to that, if it's like someone who has ADHD, I know I have ADHD and this is really hard for me. Sitting in one place for a long period of time, this right here is very hard for me. Um, <laughs> so just like being able to move around and work standing up if they need to, or like having like a lot of choices on how they can work on whatever they're working on, whether it's like a robot or um, coding or something like that. Um, Having a lot of different options is always a really good thing, whether it's like standing or sitting or, I don't know, doing jumping jacks or something like that. <laughs> uh, but just moving around is it's really helpful for me. Uh, and I want to follow up with that um, in terms of resources and collaborating. And, uh, and um, I, I have, I have a, this thing, this philosophy on our door, and, and I want to get to the point. I, I write down, leave as a better person, right outside that door. And, and I leave that message up there intentionally. And not just for my students, but for myself, okay? Because, I mean, yeah, physics and math, technical skills, yeah, that's great. But more importantly, like, you know, we all have learning differences. But how can we, um, how can we be a better person regarding that? How can you be confident in yourself? How can you take a risk? How can you learn a new skill? How can you come up and just have a better attitude about yourself? You know, 
And I will say, I never look for perfection. We're not perfect people here. We make mistakes. We're people, you know. But I'm, instead of perfection, we look for progression. And this past year, we've um, had so many opportunities and open doors. And this is where I think I encourage our students to really take that risk. And if there is a person from Microsoft or Google uh, that is inviting us about something, and, and, and that's why I say that 60 second elevator pitch is really important. To talk about where we're coming from, what our background is, hey, we have a learning difference. Well, some of the opportunities because of that elevator pitch has opened up uh, professional networking opportunities because we've encountered employees in Microsoft and Google with learning differences. And so that, that's been an avenue to connect with people at a different level. And, and so um, we've, we're very privileged to get those resources this past year because of that, that connection. So, did that answer your question? Okay. Anyone, anyone else have any questions? Maybe we could do one more, one more question. I can do it loud enough. Okay. Um, so I have an FRC team. Yeah. So and I have a school with lots of really bright students who are like quick at things. Um, and then with the six week build period, I think from some of my students who do have learning differences, um, what would be ways, how do you manage that? Because, you know, it takes them like two to three weeks before they catch on. But by then like we've already like made decisions and things are happening. So I would, how do you how do you deal with that? How do you keep how do you keep students who are maybe slower at processing stuff or keep keeping up with the schedule and what everyone else is doing and not making them feel again be like oh they're right. behind or they're they're slowing us down. I mean yeah. my my team is very supportive and they all work really well together. Yeah. So in that regard, the first family is great. Um, I would say keep them very connected and try to keep them up to date as much as possible. I would suggest maybe having kind of like a planned out schedule and you know always adding on to things that like what you've changed, what you have, so that they can see it. They might not always be able to like hear it and like make sure it sticks in their head, but visually they might learn differently. So just try to find different ways to connect to their uh, the way they understand and things. Um, it kind of depends on the way that the person learns. I know I personally learn like hands on. So um, for me, just like being able to see what's been done really helps me. But like if they're an audio learner, then like hearing it or visual learner, like Tyler said, like having a schedule. Um, there are several different kinds of ways that people learn. Um, so it kind of depends on the person. Okay, so I want to follow up with that. Um, I like to use an analogy. Anyone watch X-Men? You guys watch, you know what X-Men is, right? So uh, if you don't know the movie X-Men, is kind of, you know, it's a very popular movie. But it's, it's a movie of superheroes. It's, uh, you know, superheroes have a superpowered strength. You know, whether they're, uh, they have the ability to be invisible or to run at super high speeds or to fly around the world or shoot laser out of eyeballs, right, you know? And, and and I was like when I started with the school, I'm actually one of the founding. I, I started. I was one of the founding faculty, and I had the privilege of starting with the school. Is that's kind of the lens I had approaching Walcott. Is these students, some of these students that come here, um, have these superpowers. And and the, the, regarding to your question with that student that um, has a slower processing, and this is something that I always, you know, uh, work through in my courses, but. Um, and it's called differential learning and trying to find different ways for that student to feel successful because they're going to be extremely good at certain things and as Tyler said, having a plan, having a schedule, okay? Because uh, in X-Men, okay, one superpower, or one superhero uh, hero can't do everything. And, and uh, I think if you guys, well, I don't know, there's so many X-Men movies out there, but um, we all have to work as a team because each team member has a superpower. We can, we can really collaborate. We can work together and uh, accomplish things, uh, amazing things, amazing things like building our robot or things. You know, so I'm really, I'm really proud of our students, and I'm looking at the time. I think we have to wrap up in a few minutes, right? So, so um, I just want to end with this. Um, again, we're so, so thankful to have you guys here, and hopefully, this is uh, something that really, I don't know, I'm hoping that kind of open your eyes about. 
you know, students would learn the differences, and I hope that going forward, we can really celebrate and um, just kind of admire the successes of our students, and hopefully this is something that we can address and support first uh, in the near future. Um, I'm, I'm ex very excited about next year, uh, and I hope to see you guys again next year at Nationals again, right? Yeah. We're gonna come back, so hopefully we'll see you guys next year. Uh, and, uh, and we're gonna do something great and exciting next year because we have a lot of ideas in the works right now. Uh, so we want to thank you very much for coming today and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conferences and robotics competition. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And uh, yeah, have a great day. So thank you very much.